I want to talk about studios and the studio system. Uh, this term studio gets thrown around a lot and every company that makes a movie calls itself a studio, but they're not really a studio. Uh, let me give you my definition of a studio. Movie studios are all located in Southern California. There's not that many, uh, five or six studios. They've been down there for 90 or 100 years or more. They have hundreds of acres of land. They have huge football field size sound stages. Um, studio, studios down in Southern California are like self-contained cities. They have hospitals, they have restaurants, they have their own police force, they have their own fire department. And so that's a traditional studio. And that's a lot more than just a company that finances the production of a movie. Netflix today makes all kinds of movies, but technically it's not a studio, it's a streaming service. So there's all kinds of different terms. And I wanna talk about studios, our main studios, the ma they're called the majors. And uh, most of the studios started uh, 100 years ago or close to it. And they're all down in Southern California. I'm sure many of you have been to Universal Studios and you've taken the tour. And so you saw what studios look like. We only have five or six studios and they're all located in the Los Angeles area for two reasons. One, the weather's very good. And two, lots of inexpensive land. Now one of those is still true and the other's not. There's uh, not very much inexpensive land in Los Angeles anymore, but the studio started 100 years ago in the 1920s. The oldest studios like Universal and Paramount, they go back to 1915, 1916. And so at that time period, there was lots of available land that didn't cost very much. And there's a lot of sunshine in Los Angeles. And I can attest to that. I'm from Los Angeles. So what does good weather have to do with movie making? Well, when these studios started, movies were silent. This was the silent era. And talking movies didn't come along until the 1920s, 1927, with the movie The Jazz Singer, a Warner Brothers production. So when the studio started, movies were silent productions, which means they would film outdoors. They would throw their cameras in the back of the truck, drive out somewhere in the streets of Los Angeles, and just start filming. So noise didn't matter because movies were silent, except for music. And so uh, outdoor filming was pretty commonplace during the silent era. So that's why weather was important. Los Angeles has sunny weather most of the year, which allows for outdoor filming. So that's why the studios are based down in Southern California. Good weather, and back when they started, lots of inexpensive land. So let's talk about our major studio today, Disney. Disney started in the 1920s as an animation company. Uh, Walt Disney, probably the most famous name in the entertainment world, came out from the Midwest with his brother Roy, and Walt Disney was an animator. So he started an animation company in Los Angeles to make cartoons for the movies. And he immediately had some failures. Uh, had some failures with animated characters like Oswald the Rabbit. And Walt Disney does not accept failure very well. So after he had some setbacks with his cartoons, he spent a lot of time thinking about a new cartoon character that he could make cartoons about that the public would enjoy. And he came up with the idea for a mouse. And he named the mouse Mortimer, Mortimer the mouse. And his wife Lillian hated that name Mortimer. And she suggested, Walt, why don't you change the name to Mickey? So Walt Disney changed the name and he created Mickey Mouse, which is the foundation for Disney. And so Walt Disney made several breakthroughs in his career. His first one was with his first major Mickey Mouse cartoon called Steamboat Willie. And the breakthrough he made 
was the decision to add sound to the cartoon. Because Walt Disney was finishing the cartoon right around the time when talking movies were starting, right around 1927. And Disney started Steamboat Willie as a silent cartoon, and then he realized he would have a lot more success with Steamboat Willie if he added sound. This was very expensive, and the technology was unproven, but Walt Disney was stubborn, and Walt Disney also loved technology. One of the things of the trademarks of his career was that he loved new technology. So he wanted to spend the extra money and put sound effects on Steamboat Willie, and that's what he did. It's not a talking cartoon, but there are sound effects throughout the cartoon. And this made Steamboat Willie a huge success. When the, when the cartoon started playing in theaters, people would want the cartoon to play over and over again because they loved it so much. So Steamboat Willie, the first Mickey Mouse cartoon, put the Disney company on the map. And so Disney continued to make animated cartoons for another decade. And then in the late 1930s, Walt Disney had an idea. He wanted to make a feature-length cartoon movie. A full movie which was animated. Now this had never been done before and this was Disney's second great innovation and his second great idea and once again had this idea failed then it probably would have bankrupt the company but Disney was a creative genius he was also very stubborn and he felt strongly that if the storytelling was good enough and the animation was good enough the audience would sit through a two-hour cartoon, and he was right. So in the late 1930s, Disney went to work on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and that created the template for feature-length animated movies, which we still have today, which are some of the biggest money-making movies ever, and Disney was the first company to create one. What Disney realized about an animated movie was that you had to involve the audience emotionally. So Disney felt the key to the movie being successful was the movie's ability to make the audience cry. Disney knew that he could make audiences laugh because that's what he had been doing with cartoons for years, but can you make the audience cry? Are they going to suspend belief so long that they're going to cry for a drawing. So that was the big test, the big hurdle that Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs had to pass, make the audience cry. Disney was a nervous wreck when the movie premiered in Los Angeles. He sat there clutching his wife Lillian's hand, waiting to see how the audience responded. And... The audience responded just the way he hoped they would. They hissed at the evil witch, the evil queen, and they laughed at the seven dwarfs. And then when the audience thought Snow White had died, the audience started crying. And that was the moment that Disney knew he had a hit. And he did. Snow White was a huge success. It created the full-length animated movie, which we've had ever since the late 30s. And it made more than $8 million for the Disney company, which was a lot of money in the 1930s. And uh, Disney created a new form of entertainment, animated movies. So now, in the 1950s, Disney's bored. Whenever Walt Disney gets bored, something good happens. Because Disney had been doing animation for more than 20 years. He wanted to do something different. And he had an idea for an amusement park a theme park. He couldn't get the idea out of his head. He was not impressed with amusement parks, carnivals that were available around in the 1950s. He thought they were poorly run and they were often dirty and that it was not a place that a family could enjoy being together. But Disney thought, if I can do it better, if I can do it different, then I could really have something special on my hand. So, Disney showed up one night at the house of one of his animators, and he said, I've got this idea in my head for this theme park. 
get your get your sketch pad, get your pencils. I want you to draw what I envision. And they spent the whole night drawing what eventually became Disneyland. And Disney based Disneyland around Disney movies. We had a Snow White ride. We had a Dumbo ride. And so Disney wanted to go into the theme park business, which was a complete departure from animated movies. And nobody knew if it was going to succeed or not. But Walt Disney was stubborn and he was a creative genius and he bet the company's future on it. And so in July 1955, Disneyland opened and it opened to lines uh, lined up for, for nearly a mile long and people could not wait to get into Disneyland. So that was Disney's next great accomplishment was creating the template for the theme parks that we have today. Another great thing that Disney did in the 50s, he was the first studio boss to join television because television became hugely popular in the 50s and the studios had a very dismissive attitude toward TV. They thought it was a fad. They thought it would go away. They didn't see it as competition for the movie business. Disney was different. He was the opposite. He said no. He said Disney's the future and I can reach people in their living room. Television is a good thing. So television had wanted Disney to do a show for years. And in the last year or two of finishing Disneyland, Disney was running short of money. So he struck a deal with ABC that if ABC would give him the money it needed to finish, finish building Disneyland, he would do a show for ABC. And that's what happened. And what did Disney do with his first television show? He turned it into one big infomercial for Disneyland. He started showing drawings and talking about how wonderful it was going to be. He started building anticipation. He started using television to promote another part of his business, which was the theme park business. So by the time Disneyland opened, people knew about it. They couldn't wait to get in. And Disney had another success on his hands. So Disney was an entertainment genius. And Disney created the entertainment business that we have today with theme parks and television and movies all supporting each other. And that really evolved from what Disney did. And it really started with Mickey Mouse in the 1920s. So Disney started an animation company and has become a full-blown studio. And today it's one of our biggest, most important studios we have. Made $13 billion last year, 2019. More money than any other studio. And uh, had seven movies that top $1 billion. So Disney's here to stay extremely successful. Let's talk about the golden age of Hollywood. This is the first couple decades from the 1920s through the 1940s. Everything was wonderful for the movie industry. In fact, the movie industry basically had a monopoly on entertainment. They had their highest audience in history. In the 1940s, more than 90 million people every week were attending a movie theater. Television was not competition in the 1940s, so the movie industry was it. People loved movies. So let's go back even before the 1920s. Um, in the 19 Around 1900, we have theaters in Los Angeles called Nickelodeons because they cost a nickel. 1910, a few thousand theaters around the country. By 1920, the movie industry is the fifth largest industry in the United States. Ever since movies started, people loved movies. They liked going out to movie theaters. They liked the entertainment that movies provided, so movies were extremely popular. And the studios were the factories that created the movies. I want you to think of movie studios as movie factories. They turned out movies 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So the studios that we had during the 1920s and 1930s, during the Golden Age, were MGM, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, 
Paramount Studios, Universal Studios, and Columbia Studios, and RKO Studios. Disney started in the 1920s, but it was an animation company for the first couple of decades. Not really a major studio yet. So these were our major studios during the time period, and the biggest, most successful studio of them all was MGM, Metro Goldwyn Mayer. MGM had 5,000 employees during the 20s and 30s. It operated 24 hours a day, had three eight-hour shifts. It was a movie factory located in Culver City, California, MGM opened in 1924, and it opened three years before movies started talking. The logo at MGM was a roaring lion named Leo the Lion. Very famous, famous logo. And MGM opened up three years before talking movies started, so for the first several years, it made silent movies. And then in 1927, Warner Brothers perfected new technology to have a talking movie, The Jazz Singer. But MGM wanted to take a wait-and-see attitude because it was a very expensive conversion to go from silent movies to talking movies. You had to build sound stages, these big, huge football field-sized buildings, which were soundproof. And so it was very expensive to start making talking movies. And what if the public didn't like them? So... MGM was very slow to convert to talking movies. In fact, MGM was the last major studio to make the transition from silent movies to talking movies. And it's ironic uh, that MGM was the last because the type of movies that MGM was famous for during this period was musicals. MGM was the king of musicals. So, Several characteristics about studios during the 20s and 30s. Uh, most of the major studios were famous, well-known for certain types of movies. For example, MGM specialized in musicals. They made big, beautiful, lavish musicals, and they were wonderful musicals that MGM made. Warner Brothers was made for its realistic dramas pulled right out of the headlines. Warner Brothers had a lot of movies about crime. During the 1920s, uh, we had Prohibition and Gangsters, so Warner Brothers took a lot of movies, ideas from what was going on in the culture at the times, and they made a lot of gangster movies. <clears throat> Universal Studios was famous for monster movies. Dracula, Frankenstein, Phantom of the Opera, the Mummy, the Wolfman. And one of the reasons that Universal specialized in these monster movies, uh, it's not because they love monsters so much, it's because they didn't have a lot of money for movie stars. Uh, movie stars, some of the movie stars during this time period were getting paid two, three, four thousand dollars a week. And MGM was a lower budget studio. So MGM could not afford this kind of salary, so MGM discovered that it was cheaper to buy green makeup and put green makeup on Boris Karloff and turn him into Frankenstein than it was to pay a star salary. So MGM started specializing in monster movies. And ironically, if you look back at these movies now from the 20s and 30s, these are classics. You know, the first Frankenstein, the first Dracula movie. These are considered movie classics. So MGM became very famous for monster movies. So during this golden age of Hollywood, all of the studios operated under something called the studio system. And that's what I want to talk about now, the studio system. And there were several characteristics of the studio system that are important and the studio system is gone today. We no longer have this way of operating studios. It basically ended in the 40s and 50s, but for the 20s and 30s and part of the 40s, this is the way the studios operated. And the key component of the studio system was the movie star, because back in that time period, 
Movie stars were the most important commodity a studio could have. The more stars that worked for your studio, the better studio you were. Because the public absolutely loved movie stars. The public still does, but in today's world, the movie star is a little less important or a lot less important than it was back then. The studio that had the most stars working for it was MGM. Metro Goldwyn Mayer. The slogan, the logo at MGM was, we have more stars than there are in heaven. And it was really true. All the top stars wanted to work at MGM. They paid the best. They made the best movies. MGM made more money each year during the 20s and 30s than all the other studios put together. They were just on top of the movie world because they had the best, best stars working for them. Some of the other studios were lower budget studios like RKO and Universal, and they didn't have the top stars working for them. So they made some good movies, but they didn't make the biggest amount of money. Universal Studios specialized in monster movies. RKO, a low budget studio. Most, most famous movie that RKO made was King Kong in the 1930s. RKO made King Kong in the 30s. In fact, RKO was such a low budget studio that the joke about RKO during World War II was that RKO was the safest place to hide during a air raid because it hasn't had a hit in years. So RKO was kind of like the joke studio, but it actually made some good movies back then. So every star, everybody who worked for the studio was under contract exclusive contract for that studio. It's kind of like sports today. If you play for a certain team, you're contractually obligated to play for that sports team for maybe two, four, five years. That's the way it was with the studios. You were contracted to work for MGM or Warner Brothers and you couldn't work for any other studio. That was another component of the studio system was the contract. And these contracts were very restrictive on what a star could and could not do. The power really laid with the studio. The studio told the stars what movies they had to make. So no matter how big a star you were, the studio boss, like Louis B. Mayer at MGM, he would tell the star what movie he wanted the star to make. And if the star didn't want to make that movie, then the star would be suspended. It didn't matter how famous they were, you had to do what you were told. That was part of the contract system. Another part of the contract system was something called the potato clause, which basically said uh, you can't get fat. You've got you've to maintain a good appearance for your public, and if you start putting on weight, you're going to have to lose it. And so stars were constantly on a diet. Uh, this was always a problem for a very famous MGM star named Judy Garland who you know as uh, Judy, uh, Dorothy, and Wizard of Oz. Judy Garland uh, had a propensity to gain weight, and uh, so she would go to the restaurant commissary at MGM, and she would order a steak sandwich for lunch, and the waitress would bring her soup, and she would tell the waitress, well, I ordered a steak sandwich, and the waitress would lean over and say, Mr. Mayor thinks you're getting a little fat, so you need to start eating more soup. That's the way the studios worked. Uh, they took a very aggressive uh, position with their stars. They held all the power. In exchange for that, these stars were well paid and they were famous. The, they created fame for these stars. MGM used to boast that it could take anybody and make them a star. And it really could. The studio really had that ability because MGM had the best makeup artists in the business working there. A man named Max Factor, who still has his cosmetics sold at stores today, he was the head of the MGM makeup department. They had the best makeup artists, they had the best stylists doing hair, they had the best photographers in the world. So once they made you look beautiful, they would take your photo and send these photos to magazines and newspapers all over the world and make you famous. So MGM could really create fame for you. So in in exchange for fame and a very high salary, you had to do what the studio told you. 
Studio contracts also typically had a morals clause, which said that you could not go off and elope on the weekend and come back to the studio on Monday married. You literally, you literally had to check with the studio if you wanted to get married because a lot of these stars, their fan base was based on the idea that they were eligible bachelors or that they didn't have a spouse. And all of a sudden, if they turned up married, then that would cause a problem for the studios. So the studios had a lot of power and they were very restrictive over their stars. The main component of the studio system was that the studios had a complete monopoly on the movie business. And they did. Studios controlled production, which is the making of the movies. Studios controlled distribution, which is sending canisters of film out all over the world. And studios controlled exhibition, which means the studios own their own theaters. Exhibition means the theater business. And back during the 20s and 30s and 40s, studios own their own theaters throughout the United States. So Paramount Studios would only show Paramount movies at a Paramount theater. Uh, MGM owned theaters in the best cities, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, and MGM movies would show only in MGM theaters. So this is, this is what helped the studios do so well and have a complete stranglehold on the movie business for the first several decades. And it also led to the demise of the studio system because a monopoly is illegal in this country. So a monopoly basically is when one, one group of companies controls an entire business. So the studios controlled the movie business. For example, a monopoly today would be if McDonald's restaurants owned every cow in America. And that would be unfair. Where would Burger King get beef to sell hamburgers if McDonald's owned all the cows? So that's not fair. So the movie business was not fair. It was an unfair monopoly. And this led to the breakup of the studio system in the 1940s. And the breakup of the system came from the Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court in 1948, issued a famous ruling called the Paramount case of 1948, which said the movie studios are running a monopoly and they had to break it up because it was illegal and they had to get out of the theater business. The studios had to get rid of their theaters. They could still make movies, they could still distribute movies, but they could not own the theaters. That was decided in the Paramount case of 1948. And that was a huge blow to the studios because it meant the studios lost their guaranteed audience. When they owned theaters, they knew how many people would turn out. And once they had to compete for theater space with every other studio, everything changed. So after the Paramount case in 48, the studios throughout the 1950s were getting out of the movie theater business and this meant that they cut down on production, they cut down on the amount of movies they made every year and uh, they started laying people off, meaning less movies, less need for actors. So going into the 1950s, this was one of several devastating things that happened to the studios. And it really changed the movie business and ultimately led to near bankruptcy in the 1960s.